You're listening to the Career Jump Podcast. Insights, interviews, and success stories to inspire and give you the edge when you make your next career jump. Hosted by your career concierge, Andrew McCaskill. Hello, welcome back to the Executive Career Jump Podcast. I'm your host and career concierge, Andrew McCaskill. And very excited today to be joined by Dr. Chris Walton. How are you doing, Chris? I'm very well, Andrew. Very well indeed. Thank you. Yes. Very good. Well, thanks for freeing up the time to come on. Really excited to talk to you, Paul. For those who haven't come across your work previously, tell us a bit more about your background and, and the types of things you get involved with, Chris. <laughs> Crikey. Well, I am a doctor of integrative medicine and a performance psychologist. That's uh, what I've been doing for my sins for the last 20 plus years. My work's very much focused around mindset change and changing those underlying subconscious patterns so that we can develop more self-belief and confidence. So I look at the mind and body as one integrative system, but my speciality is really changing the mindset. And I created a a system called the Gamma Mindset. And Gamma is something we can maybe talk about because this is the brain state that we want to be able to get into every day, which switches your stress response off and your higher circuits on. So that's what I developed. I actually did my PhD in that, which was very interesting because that sort of shows how we actually can real time in the real world rather, improve our self-belief and confidence, not as a changing state of motivation, but a deep down sort of different state of our natural state of being. So that self-belief and confidence becomes natural for us. And that's what I've been doing over the, over many, many years now. Yeah. Very good. So what was it that kind of got you involved with that in the first place? Why was that always of such interest to you? I started my career, Andy, in the health and fitness industry back in the 90s. I started personal training before personal training was a thing in this country, you know, like I say, in the early 90s. And I was a strength and conditioning coach to professional athletes. I trained six out of the top 10 world best squash players. I trained the world number one and world champion man, the world number one and world champion woman, and six of the top 10. So I wasn't a squash player myself, but I had a lot of knowledge and strength and conditioning, nutrition, and all that sort of stuff. My first degree was a sports science degree and all that. So what got me into mindset was that in the men's game of squash, I mean, we're talking absolute elite level fitness. The fitness was a given, you know, the skill level was a given to be in the top five or six. It's, it's a given, you know, the, the experience was almost the same, but the same two people, two or three people out of the top 10 kept winning every single tournament. And I sort of made me realize, well, what's, what's going on here? You know, the, the skill, the, the reaction time, the reflexes, the endurance, all that was a given. And what it was when it came down to it was, yeah, but when the pressure's on, who can maintain their skills, their knowledge and experience on the court without losing it, without stress getting too much? Who can maintain and get in the, that high performance flow zone and win? And that absolutely fascinated me because I was, I was training these people physically and I could see there was no difference, not in strength, not in VO2 max, not in recovery time, not in flexibility. There's no difference between the guys. Uh, but the same people kept winning. And when it came down to it, it was a mindset. It was an absolute deep down mindset. So when I got into that, it was like a duck to water to me. I really got into that probably like 1997 is when I really started getting into it and looked at the mind-body connection. And that that sent me on a whole journey where, you know, some years later, I left the health and fitness industry, went into psychology, ended up doing a master's in psychology in the early 2000s, and then went on from there, you know, and really developed these mindset techniques, really originally with an aid to performance, but performance means many things to many people. You don't have to be an elite athlete to want to perform well. And obviously, you know, people in the corporate life and their careers, they want to do well. So it's very, very uh, transferable from the world of sport to normal people wanting to change their mindset, change their deep down beliefs, be able to focus, clear those stressors and really be able to perform at the best. So that's what sort of led me into it, you know, initially from the world of sport. No, I love that story. Uh, And I didn't realize that was the origination story. So thanks for sharing that. So how do people tend to get in their own way then, Chris? What are we doing that's polluting our mindset or creating blockers in terms of performing at a better level? The key to all of this, Andy, is the way that the mind is structured. And probably most of us today have heard ideas of, well, we've got a conscious mind and we've got a subconscious mind. You know, the subconscious mind is a, is a massive buzzword on the internet. You know, there's billions of searches every day. But what does it really mean? Well, really, you know, we get a conditioned mind from the second we're born, even before we're born, 
we are inheriting the chemistry of what our mother's experiencing in her environment. So she's in a stressed environment. The little fetus is increasing more stress. If she's in a happy environment, the little fetus is increasing more serotonin and happy hormones, you know, and that has an impact straight away. So we don't come out with a, with a clean slate. Well, certainly those first seven years, of course, we're downloading the rules of life. You know, we look at our parents and our care providers and who brought us up in the world. We're watching how everybody interacts and we download that. And, you know, most of us have uh, programming today that's outdated, not necessarily bad or traumatic, just outdated stuff, Andy. I mean, we grew up in the same decade, you know, when you, you grow up in the 70s and the 80s. It, it's a different world to today, isn't it? But you've still got that programming that you had as a youngster that allowed you to survive in the world and, and hopefully thrive in the world. And the bottom line is that some of that programming today is outdated and creating stress in the system. So when you've got underlying stress reactions, automatic stress reactions and outdated limiting beliefs, you know, at the subconscious level, those old things bubbling away that are no longer helping you today, that's a conflict. When we have a conscious mind, in our conscious mind, we want a new job. You know, we want a better career. We want to change career. We want to change industry. We want to do something different. We want to go out on our own. We've, we're making that conscious decision but we know in the body, the body immediately tells us, oh, I feel anxiety. I feel self-doubt. I feel a lack of confidence. I feel insecurity. I don't feel safe. You know, you can have all those feelings. You're not, oh, my God. Well, they're not conscious feelings. You know, you don't choose those. If you choose those, you, you're obviously mad. You know, we don't choose those. We don't choose emotions. They're, they're subconscious programs that get triggered depending on what's happening in our life. So when we've got that conflict between what we want and what's bubbling away with our emotional reactions and belief systems and old learned habits and patterns, that's a stress response, you know? Conscious, you want this. Subconscious is not an alignment. And that is the biggest reason we get in our way. Because when that happens and we have a little stress response, the brain switches off, we drip feed chemistry into the body, stress chemistry in the body. It doesn't make us feel good and we don't tend to go for it. But if we do go for it, we're not really doing it with our full skill knowledge and experience because we're under that little bit of stress because of this conflict so that's what really gets in our way you know and then of course we have lots of inner dialogue negative inner dialogue and we can go round and round and often round and round and down and down you know so that is the nitty gritty of what gets in our way you know we don't consciously choose those emotions if you're looking for a new job or you've been on that you know looking for that job for a good while now and you're constantly thinking you know you're constantly feeling a little bit too much anxiety a little bit too much self-doubt those insecurities come in and then you know they start to back up your limiting beliefs. Can I get a new job? Am I good enough? You know, is my skill set up to speed? You know, is my experience good enough? Am I as good as all the others out there? Then, you know, you, you're bringing yourself into quite a negative loop there, which is not going to help you. And of course, that doesn't help you perform in the interviews. It doesn't help you with how you approach the whole, you know, method of getting a new job, you know, all the things that you, you do. So, you know, clearing the, the old outdated stuff and aligning with what you want to do is not only a key for performing at your best, it's a key for a flow state and it's a key to be able to enjoy the process of getting a job or playing a game or performing well at work or whatever. The key is the alignment of your mind. Yeah, no, that's a fascinating topic, isn't it? Absolutely mm. fascinating. And we see a lot, as you uh, know, we help a lot of people that are in transition. And by that, we mean they've left one job and are looking to get hired in another. But what tends to happen, we find, is even people that felt like they'd conquered a lot of their limiting beliefs, when these major life events happen, they seem to bubble back up again, don't they? So <laughs> for anybody that's listening to this that is maybe, you know, experiencing some of that stress and anxiety whilst looking for a job at the moment and is getting rejections and data points that are further confirming those limiting beliefs to some extent in their yeah. mind, what kind of things can be people doing to provide a bit of a circuit breaker or to interject and to help themselves? Yeah, good one. Yeah, good one. I think the key is, first of all, is that the self-awareness that this is how I'm feeling, you know, and, and obviously that should be quite obvious. You are noticing negative emotions as a little bit of a theme in your life now each week, etc. That's obviously not going to help you, you know. Now, like you said, when we're on a roll and when we're doing really well and when things are going good for us and, you know, work's happy, we're happy, we're doing what we want. Hey, everything seems to be fine. Those things don't surface. 
This is what we see. Same as going back to the squash players. Hey, when the pressure's on, when you're in the semi-final or when you're in the final, how do you perform now? Hey, the skills are the same. The experience is the same. The fitness is the same. But now you're in a pressured environment. Now your doubts come up. Now your self-insecurities come up. The same for people in the job market. And of course, the job market and getting a new job, it's so linked unconsciously, deep, deep down to our survival. You know, for most people, of course, it means money. Money means we can feed our family. That means we can survive properly. We might not think of it like that, but, you know, the number one goal of the organism is to survive. You know, so when we get those challenges, that's when we really feel our stuff. And it can be quite intense, you know, if, if particularly if, if money's an issue and, you know, you like you say, you've been looking for a job for six months, 12 months, and, you know, that really can put the pressure on you so that then you're in under even more stress. That's a tricky situation because you've got to break that cycle. So how do we do that? Well, firstly, acknowledgement of, of where you're at, acknowledgement of what those emotions are. And ideally, to cut to the chase, what you would really want is a technique to use to apply to clear those emotions. You know, we can do it positively. We can, we can do positive thinking and we can have conscious mind, positive thinking strategies to try and keep ourselves, you know, in the moment and buoyant and focusing on positive things. And obviously, that's a good thing to do. You know, picking things throughout the day or having little memory anchors in your mind that when you find yourself being stressed and that stress is getting a little bit too out of control and, you, and your inner voice is a little bit negative, it's like, hey, what can I think of in the moment? I use a model, Andy, to manage the conscious mind. And this is a model I used way back in the 90s and then added a bit on. And I call it PMA squared. Now, PMA, most people will think PMA, positive mental attitude. Yeah, I remember that. It used to be a big thing in the 90s. So I have added an extra bit on there. So it's, it's PMA, positive mental attitude, with present moment awareness so that you are right here in the present moment. And if you think about it, most of our mind, particularly when you're looking for a job and you know there's, there's a bit of stress in your life, your future pacing, you're living in the future, what's gonna happen next, what will happen at this interview, et cetera, et cetera. Or, and you're living in the past, You know we're ruminating about things that have already happened. So for the most part, particularly with a busy life and how much we are overwhelmed with information today with social media and whatnot, for the most part, you know, we're not in the present moment. We are being run. We're living in the future and we're living in the past. Now, when you live in the future and you live in the past consciously, it's your subconscious mind that's driving your life. You know, it's completely driving you. So one of the keys at a conscious level is to bring yourself back into the present moment. If you embody yourself in the present moment, be fully here right now and not be thinking too much about the future or the past, but you're right here right now. And then you choose, you consciously choose a positive mental attitude so you'd have a little couple of anchors like it could be if you've got children you think you're a little child you know or one of the best times you're on holiday you know some of the really lovely photos you've got of late you know with, with your children and stuff you just think of those little things and it ah it settles you down think about that for a little while just feel the positivity and then carry on what you're doing in the moment with as much awareness of yourself in that moment so as a conscious mind activity, PMA squared, you can say either way around, present moment awareness with a positive mental attitude or a positive mental attitude with present moment awareness. But your goal with your conscious awareness is to keep bringing yourself back into the moment, stop future pacing, stop worrying about things that haven't happened yet, things that have already happened, it's done. You know, So you've got to sort of condition yourself to become in as aware as you can in the moment and feel good. And that's a conscious mind positive sort of thinking activity but it's a very useful strategy and i love it PMA squared because it's really simple you could go around your houses trying to do all sorts of methods of managing your mind but the bottom line is unless you're in the moment you can't manage your mind anyway because you're being run by the subconscious so at a conscious level pma squared bringing yourself back to the moment breathing in the moment feeling your body choosing a positive attitude or a feeling state a memory just to bring you back into that and then focus on what you're doing with all your skills knowledge and experience in the moment and it's surprising how effective that is it might sound simple but if you actually do it and use it and go oh hang on a minute i'm feeling a bit anxiety i've got an interview in three days time i'm thinking about it and i'm feeling it now well it's in three days time let me bring me back to the moment take a breath in come back here a nice little touch is actually just touching your fingertips in your palms so you've got a, a light physical anchor okay i'm here what am i doing now focus on that i'll think about that later that's a conscious mind activity love now, that uh, yeah, keep it simple. What's simple and what works is what I like. 
Now, of course, the next level to that, of course, is sorting your subconscious out because inevitably, as I say, in stressful times, that's when you really notice your subconscious stuff, those anxieties and fears and self-doubts and insecurities pop up. And so much so in this situation, looking for a new job, as I say, because it's so linked deep within us to surviving, you know, so then you're into a whole different ball game. So now you're looking at, well, how can we change the subconscious? Now, this was my and is my passion. This is what I did my PhD on. My PhD dissertation is reprogramming the subconscious mind for increased self-belief, confidence, and performance. And it's the only study, this was fascinating to me, it's the only study in the world of psychology that actually shows you how to increase self-belief and confidence. There's nothing in the whole of psychology, would you believe? I didn't believe that, but when you look at all the studies, there's nothing that shows you how to increase self-belief and confidence. Most of the psychology is focused on the dark side. You know, well, okay, how do we get rid of anxiety? How do we, you know, that's great. You want to do that. But what about the other stuff? We want self-belief and confidence. And that's what I did. So I created a technique called the gamma mindset technique. It's a simple technique to do. And it creates something called gamma brainwaves. And I'll just tell you a little bit about this. So gamma brainwaves are the brainwaves of peak performance, of optimal functioning, of the flow state. It's when your brain's, when you create gamma brainwaves, more of your brain cells fire at the same time. And when they fire at the same time, you get that state of oneness, that state of flow, you get hyper interconnectivity. And one of the real exciting things is, Andy, you can process information rapidly, rapid amounts of processing without the stress response. Your stress response is switched off. You've sort of gone to a new level of order and connectivity in your brain. And that has a massive amount of benefits. Now, prior to my study, what we've seen with gamma waves is we see it in Buddhist monks with thousands of hours of meditation experience. But we don't see it in monk, we don't see it in people who meditate that don't have all those thousands of hours, unless you do this technique that I created, which is a scientifically sort of validated technique. It has four steps as reasons why it creates gamma. We know the mechanism of action. But the bottom line is this allows. For, as I said, this rapid information processing allows for rapid changes at that subconscious level. So you can change those old, outdated patterns in six, eight, 10 minute little sessions a day, really powerful little sessions that allow you. I'd seen this in my clinic and in my practice, which I've had for 23 years. I'd seen this loads and loads and loads of times. You know, people go off and they're better and they improve and, accept, and so on. But I wanted to measure this to say, you know, over a long period of time, does this work? Does it actually do what we want to do? Or is it just a state change? It makes you feel good in the moment. So I measured the technique over 14 years. It was a 14 year project in a way that started you know, way back when and, and finished last year. And so we can confidently say it's scientifically validated to show that this technique increases self-belief and confidence. And even people 14 years ago that used it were receiving the benefits today. Those are permanent changes. It's not just a state change. It's a permanent change. And the increase in self-belief and confidence increased their performance and performance was work related performance. So that was a very exciting uh, study for me, very, very, I suppose, uh, satisfying study for me to show, aha, we, here's the data. And it's the only, like I say, it's the only technique in the whole of psychology that shows you how and is validated to increase self-belief and confidence. And I, I, you know, so that's what I get out to the world now because it's, you know, who doesn't want that? We all want that. We totally all want that. Hey everybody, it's uh, Andrew here. Just wanted to very briefly interrupt this podcast episode to tell you a little bit more about our Career Jump Club. So our Career Jump Club was created to help job seekers understand what they want and how to get it, right? So becoming a club member is a great move if you're looking to get the clarity and confidence in order to secure your next role. With the membership, you get a number of different things. So First thing you get is access to our online platform, which has over 30 videos, 40, 50 different templates, workbooks, and it takes you through everything from sort of understanding what you want to how to position your CV and LinkedIn, how to interview, how to close offers and negotiate better salaries, a full end to end job search course effectively for senior leaders. So you get that, you get a fortnightly group coaching call. Um, which is with me and with the other members where we bounce around best practice, share slide decks, share techniques and share the latest data on what's working for people. And you get to most importantly become part of our closed LinkedIn group and our closed community. And 
in there is where the magic often happens because you get people referring each other into opportunity, supporting each other and just share it. And that's what it's all about. So if you're financially able and you'd like to invest in your job search, head on over to www.execcareerjump.com or one word forward slash club and you'll find the landing page and come and give it a go. We'll see you in there. Anyway, back to the pod. I'm interested in what part do you think people's careers play in their overall well-being? Mm, that's a very good question. Well, I think, again, going back to the first and foremost, you know, first and foremost, survival. If the organism, if us, if our deep down st- who we are, our f- priority is to survive. And of course, you know, within our careers, for most of us, that means money and money allows us to live and have the lifestyle and survive. So first and foremost, that might be getting challenged. You know, of course, if you're financially wealthy and it's not a big deal, it's not so much of a challenge. But, you know, if finances are getting a little bit tight and you think, hey, I've got I've got enough money to last for a year. And then you get to 10 months and you go, oh, I've got enough money to last for two months. That's the, that's survival stuff. You know, that's that's stress. And, and that you'd really be better off clearing that reaction, that stress reaction, because obviously you can't think clearly when we go into stress. Your brain switches off and it's downhill from there. So. I would say that's the primary one. But then, of course, you've got a lot of identity that can be wrapped up into your uh, career. You know, if you spent 10, 15 years in one certain industry, one certain type of role, and then it's time to change, you know, things have moved on, technology's taken over, you've got to look for something else, you've got to move into a new industry. That's all new stuff. So the questions then come up, you know, can I do this? Like you said at the start, it challenges those belief systems that you haven't perhaps noticed before. You know, can I do it? Can I make the transition? Am I good enough? Do I have enough experience? But all those feedback into that survival pattern. If we were to get right to the nitty gritty, it is that survival pattern. But of course, like I say, you've got status wrapped up into your career, you know, image, if that's a thing for you, status and image, not that that's a, a good or a bad thing. You know, yourself of identity, I am a x you know and now that x has gone away and oh what am i now you know depending on how much you've got attached of your real deep down identity to your role and what you do so it's probably one of the biggest stresses that and a relationship breakup you know it's probably one of the biggest stresses human beings can have and primarily because it it does come down to survival but also status image achievement and you know having a purpose achieve you know doing something in the world with our life and if we feel that's stunted it can be really stressful and painful Yeah, no, I totally agree. It's interesting that you've obviously managed to align what you're passionate about with what you do for a living. Was a corporate career ever an option for you in your mind? Or have you always been really clear that, you know, you you weren't going to just trade your time for money for something that didn't have any meaning to you? Oh, Andy, you opened a can of worms there. Uh, it's It's a great question. But I mean, for me, I suppose... Your childhood is obviously so impactful to what you end up doing as an adult, isn't it? And if you've had a, a dysfunctional childhood, you know, sometimes that takes you down a dysfunctional adult path, or it can flip you the other way, you know. I've had enough of that. I didn't want that. I didn't have any money. My parents weren't X, Y, and Z. You know, I want better for my life, for my family, for my kids and all that. So for me, that was a bit a bit of me. You know, I had quite a dysfunctional childhood, which left me, you know, in need of doing some inner work when I got to an adult. And I found my passion because the only thing I could do really that I was interested in was sport, sport and fitness and training. So that I sort of found my passion that way and then led into psychology that way. But I don't think the corporate world was, I've done a lot of training within corporations, but I don't think the corporate world was ever really an option for me because my initial interest in making it in life, the only way I could really do it was, well, I like sport and fitness, so that's what I better do. So that's how it unfolded for me. No, it's really interesting to hear because, yeah, I mean, I could I could imagine you could have ended up doing whatever you wanted to do. And I'm just always inspired by people that have the courage to actually go after a mission-orientated career quite early. And I think you did, which was great. Cool. What other... Um, tips and advice would you have for people that are trying to work on their self-belief Chris I'd, I love the fact that you focus on self-belief in particular because that pesky inner critic does jump up on all of us at various times so yeah before we wrap the episode any other sort of tips around developing self-belief and self-concept would be fantastic yeah I think one of the a couple of things to think about Andy, that I'd like to mention it's another good question is just how impactful the body and what we put in the body, how impactful that is on how we feel. And a lot of the times, you know, when you're under stress, 
you don't eat so well, you maybe drink a little bit more, you know, you maybe be doing things and habits that you wouldn't normally do if you're in flow and you were happy. And you maybe don't sleep so well because of stress and maybe you don't communicate so well with your spouse or, or whatever or with your children because of these underlying stresses. Even if you've got 10% more stress than normal, that's 10% more than you want, you know. So those things can really have an impact on us. And so just maximizing or let me wind that back, just making sure that you've got your bases covered. You're sleeping well at least seven hours a night. You know, you are getting good sleep and you're waking up feeling OK, because if you don't get that right, everything is harder. And again, when you're under stress, you might not be sleeping so well or, you, you know, you might not go to bed at the same time or, or whatever, you know, if you haven't got a routine to get up to. So an obvious one, but an absolutely essential one, get your sleep right. Get your food right. Make sure you don't have long gaps between your food. So your blood sugar dips. As soon as your blood sugar dips, you feel anxious. You know, that's nothing to do with you worrying about anything. That's your physiology telling you, hey, I need food. If you're in the habit of having low blood sugar, that's not going to help you anywhere, anytime because you can't think clearly, you know. So the physiological principles of sleep, blood sugar, you, you could layer on a few more there. But making sure that as best as you can, you are minimizing stress and looking for where that stress comes from. So, you know, switching your phone off at night. Don't, you know, don't stay on your phone all night and have it on, on by your bed. Switch your Wi-Fi off if you can at night. You know, probably switch off, de-stress, let your body sleep well. Make sure you're hydrated, you know, basic physiological principles because we all do those relatively well when we're feeling well. But again, when we get stressed, the, the basics can go out a little bit. Things like I mentioned to you the other week, you know, food intolerances is a, is a very hidden, sneaky one where we're, maybe we're eating gluten and we've got a little bit of an intolerance. Maybe we're eating dairy or having too much sugar. And these things are switching us into a stress response. You know, these are things that you can control. And I think you need to control them even more when life's a bit challenged you know you need to be on that even more and that's very very important to do that you know these are very these things can make a massive difference particularly food intolerance sleep and blood sugar those are absolute if you get those right you'll generally feel okay and then you can manage your mind and, and do what you need to do so that's one thing i would say the other thing i would say is something to contemplate over the years i've had the pleasure of testing in my clinic you came to my clinic so you know how i test testing over 2000 people. So I've tested over 2000 subconscious minds. And when I'm testing a mind, so I get somebody to say something out loud. And the first statement I get them to say is, it is safe for me to change. I believe this 100%. And over 90% of people will fail that test. And what I mean by fail that test is it's when they say that their brain goes into stress. It is safe for me to change. I believe this 100%. You go into stress. Well, that's a problem. That's the biggest limiting belief of them all. Because if we don't feel any part of us, it's safe for us to change. There's always going to be a part of us going that way when we really want to be going that way. There's also part of us with that stress response on. And that's a very primitive caveman pattern, Andy. If you think about it, that is a caveman program in the mind and the brain where when we're in the caves, when we looked out on the horizon, if there was a change in our environment, that could threaten our survival. So that old fight flight pattern of survival again is still live. So if you don't think it's safe for you to change, then that's a stress response inside. And when we're in a changing environment, as rapidly changing as ours is, and particularly when you've got to change, change, you've got no choice to change. You've got to change something, whether it be your attitude, your approach to the job market, you know, your interview strategies, et cetera. You know, when you've got to change, you don't want subconscious programs that are not allowing you to change or limiting your change. So I would ask people to consider, how do you feel about change? When you think about changing your life, does it bring a stress response into you? That the reality is most people see change, whether it be conscious or unconscious, as taking something away from being long, being hard, being painful, you know, being difficult. Those old out, that's going to limit you more than anything else. We need to see change today as, hey, change brings us opportunity. Change is good for me. Change allows me to do more, to be more, to have more. I can thrive in a changing environment. You need that in your mind today more than ever. I would ask people to reflect on change itself. How do you feel about change? Are you excited and optimistic? 
Or do you feel that it's creating stress, that it's taking something away from you, that, you know, it's going to be difficult and painful? And to really have a think about that, because today we have the tools and techniques, Andy, to be able to eliminate any negative emotion in minutes, to reprogram the subconscious mind in minutes, to be able to do that in a work that maybe 30 years ago, we didn't have these tools and techniques. But, you know, time's moved on, mind-body understanding's moved on, and we have these techniques. So... To summarize my answer there is one, to get your physiology right, your sleep, your food, your hydration, get your basics right. And then so just reflect on how do you feel about change? Do you think change is good for you? Does it resonate and you're excited or does it create a stress response? And if it creates a stress response, I would reflect on that, meditate on that, clear on that, do a bit of work on that and get yourself clear because that's the biggest shift you can get. When deep down you see change as optimistic and it's going to allow you to do more, be more and have more than any change in your environment. You're at the last stage of your interview. You've nearly got it. You think you've got it and it goes to somebody else. Deflation, but you can bounce back quicker. Okay, it's change, but I can thrive in a changing world. And I think, to be honest, we all need that today. So really be able to perform well. We need to see change as a positive thing in our life and we embrace it yeah i love that reframe very very powerful indeed very very powerful and i love when you're talking about how holistic and interconnected everything is because i think a lot of these topics sometimes get broken down and addressed on an individual basis whereas you talk at a very holistic level and obviously you've got both the 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 physiological and the psychology all tied up there because even little things right like in terms of my personal experience if you get up and go for a run in the morning of course, that's good for you from a physical point of view, but it's even better for you from a mental point of view, yeah, not, not just in terms of the processing, but you've won that first battle with yourself and how you feel about yourself, your self-concept yeah. is better for the rest of the day yeah. because you got up and you did it and you stepped out and you did it. And I just find it so interesting how you can it can all become self-reinforcing in either direction if you either get direction, that yeah. nature right. It's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. So for people uh, listening then that keen to find out more about what you do and keen to dive into these topics further, what's the best way for people to reach out to you or find you? I'm on all the usual social media. I don't do too much on social media, but I'm on social, all the platforms. My website's gammamindset.com. There's a free masterclass on there that you can see my technique. You can see the brainwaves. There's programs on there. I'll, I'll do an offer for your subscribers on one of the programs. If you like, you can put that in the link if you want. You know, there's a whole ton of stuff on that website that's empowering information that's useful to know and some free stuff that you can try out and things. That's the easiest, gammamindset.com. GammaMindset.com. Brilliant. There's going to be an offer on there for people who are in transition who've listened to this, then we're very happy about that as well. And, uh, and tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing in the recruitment space as well. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. I know, as you know, my wife, many, so we're well, probably going back, what are we in now, 2021? So probably going back five years my wife, Emma, who'd been in recruitment all her career, 24 years in recruitment, and she was starting a new business uh, out in the regions, high pressure, a lot of expectation, and she was using my techniques left, right, and center, you know, like just using them daily to keep herself clear, all the expectation about business building, and she had one employee and all sorts of stuff, you know, a lot of expectation, but she used my techniques daily to, to, to clear the stress Where's the billing coming from, you know, on a new business? How am I building a new business? All that stuff to clear the stress and really make sure that her mind is in alignment with what she wants to do, that she, that her mind, there's no limiting beliefs about doing this next career, next, next part of her career, really. It was a new job, a new career, you know? So that sort of sowed a seed in my mind. I thought, God, you know, knowing what recruitment's like and the pressure in recruitment and any sales role, the pressure let me create a program, you know, let me create a program. And so what we did was she listed about 20 specific situations that recruiters, people that work in recruitment, uh, face sort of week in, week out. The, the specifics that you come up against, the specific stressors. And then I did a video session on each one of those using the two techniques that I used to clear the stress and to reprogram the mind around those topics. And then we developed that into something called the Resilient Recruiter Academy. So it's an academy, comprehensive academy, where we look at everything, all of the mind aspects, the clearing the stress and the energy aspects, how to optimize your energy. So we did that and we launched that a couple of months ago, which is going well. And then we also launched another one, which is just actually going out this week, which is called the Resilient Employees Academy. So not just for recruiters, not just for salespeople, but for anybody else that works, you know, that wants to eliminate the stress, balance the brain, optimize their energy so that they can feel good, enjoy the job and, you know, and do well. So those are the two academies that we've got out for the corporate world, which is very exciting stuff. 
really exciting stuff. Can I tell you a quick story on a study that we did that might uh, feed into some of that just to yeah. close the episode? So I worked in a large recruitment company. This was before I started working with your wife, who, by the way, was the highest performing uh, recruiter in in the globe in that organization at the time, as I'm sure you, yeah. she's told you once or twice. She did well, um, yeah. Yeah, she did very well. Anyway, before I started working with her, I was working at another very large recruitment company. And we were going through a process, Chris, of trying to work out, out of the thousand recruitment consultants we've got in the UK, what is the common denominator in the top 10 that makes them the best at what they do? So that we could oh, then hire, yeah. so that we could then hire more people like that, right? Yeah, yeah. So off we went and we got these uh, 10 people uh, out in front of us and the range was incredible. So there was everything from 23 years old to 52. So Uh we could say for a start, right, well, age is not a defining factor. There were five men and five women. Okay, right. So that's that out the park. There was every personality type you can imagine. So some were very process orientated, Chris. They were systematic around how they worked on a daily basis and how they made money. Others were more traditional phone-based people, wheelers and dealers, networkers, hustlers, very extroverted <laughs> yeah. at that end of the scale. Yeah. And so we sat there scratching our heads going, how that we can do nothing with this information because it's an eclectic mix and there's no mm. magic formula. But the one thing we found, the only common denominator across all 10 was they had an above average ability to bounce back and had above average resilience. Brilliant. And when we did a, we did some basic grit test type stuff and, and things like that as part of it. And all of them indexed higher than the rest of the population on resilience, because the one thing we all need in our working lives is the ability to run that roller coaster. And whether you're process or your people or whatever you are, you've got to have that, that common thread. So I think that recruit resilient recruiter Academy based on that uh, thing that I'm talking about there is going to make a huge difference. So excited to see how that goes in the market for you. Yeah, that's a great story as well. That's a really, really interesting story. I was wondering where you were going with that then. But yeah, I mean, fascinating, but I suppose it backs up what we know, isn't it? You know, if you've, if you've got that strong sense of self-belief and that ability to bounce back from setbacks, you know, we're all human beings. It's not about never feeling down, but of course we know. It's not how can you pick yourself up and get and bring all your next, you know, to the next thing that you're going to do, your skills, knowledge and experience with your brain switched on and you're in a state of flow. The more you can do that, I think inevitably the more successful you're going to be. So it's a great story. I appreciate that. No, no worries. And yeah, thanks again for coming in and and bringing your energy and your knowledge to the episode. It's been tremendous to reconnect. I'm sure a lot of people are going to get a lot of value from this. So please do reach out to Chris and let us know your feedback. And uh, until next time, thanks for listening. Cheers, Andy. Cheers. You've been listening to the Career Jump podcast with Andrew McCaskill. For more resources and information, just head over to the Career Jump website at www.execcareerjump.com to supercharge your job search and start making moves. Let's get to work. Let's get to work.